The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Vivian Young with 1000 Friends of Florida, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Urban Tree Selection for Sustainability. Um, there are two options for audio. You can use your computer's audio, um, which should link up automatically, or there's an option on the control panel to use your phone if you have issues with sound. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about 1000 Friends of Florida. Uh, we were founded in 1986 as a not-for-profit organization, and our work focuses on efforts to save special places and build better communities. And um, with Florida's growth once again returning to more than 1,000 new residents a day, uh, we think this is becoming more critical than ever. Uh, we have um, a bipartisan board of directors with experts from across the strait, and we focus on education, advocacy, and negotiation. Uh, we're, we're active on Facebook and uh, Twitter. Uh, we send out regular alerts, so we encourage you to uh, link up to us and, and find out what's going on in addition to our webinars. Um, I'd like to mention briefly that the webinar series is named in honor of Dr. John M. DeGrove. Um, he is recognized uh, statewide, nationally, and even internationally as a leader in the field of growth management. And we're also pleased that he was one of the founders of 1000 Friends. He had a special passion for education. So we like to think that he would appreciate us dedicating the webinar series in his honor. Um, the reason we're able to offer these webinars free of charge is thanks to our sponsors. Um, we'd like to thank them, um, Florida Steward, Archibald Foundation, Florida Guardian, Mosaic, uh, Friends, uh, Mr. Ronald Book, PA, Kadina Management, Ms. Kimberly A. DeGrove, and Dr. William Parton, uh, the Dickman Law Firm, William Howard Flowers Jr. Foundation, Kitson and Partners, the Perkins Charitable Foundation, and Mr. Robert M. Rhodes. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors and supporters who also uh, helped to make this webinar series possible and allow us to offer it free of charge and offer professional certification credits. Um, we do encourage everybody who participates in the webinars to consider donating, um, either by being a sponsor or even small gifts of $10 or more are certainly appreciated. You can donate online um, at 1000friendsofflorida.org slash donate now. Now, and you can designate it to the DeGrove Education Fund or General, or you can email me for more information. Uh, this particular uh, webinar has been approved for 1.5 AICP CM credits for planners, uh, 2 CLE uh, for Florida attorneys, and 1.5 CEUs for Florida environmental health professionals. About an hour after the webinar, you'll get an email that will have this information in it, and it will also include a link to a brief survey. Um, we encourage you to um, complete the survey and give us feedback. Uh, we are taking a hiatus um, on the webinars over the summer um, as we plan our fall series. So if you have ideas uh, for upcoming webinars, uh, please get in touch with us um, through the survey or emailing me, and we're happy to consider them all. Um, as we do nine or ten webinars a year, we get a lot of requests, but we do our best to, to try to track our webinars to topics that, that we've gotten feedback on. Um, for those of you who like to look at the PowerPoint, either during the presentation or after, it's loaded on our website under What's New um, at 1000friendsofflorida.org, and it's actually called Handouts um, on your control panel, but if you click on the um, Handouts icon, it'll maximize it, and it will show both the PowerPoint and also um, a list of references that our presenter has prepared for this, so encourage you to get that as well. If you have sound issues during the webinar, um, we do our best to ensure that we do as good a job as possible, um, but we have limited control over some of these issues. Um, you can control uh, the, the volume on your own computer, um, and there's also a sound check if you're having more serious issues. 
Um, we encourage you to ask questions um, anytime during the webinar or at the end. Uh, because we have several hundred people on the line, we can't have you ask them personally. So we ask you to maximize the question box and type in your question. Um, if possible, please keep it as succinct as possible because I have to edit them while I'm speaking. And sometimes if it's a really long question, I might miss the gist of what you're trying to ask. So keep your questions as succinct as possible and we will do our best to answer um, as many of them as possible as time permits. Um, I'd like to now introduce our presenter, um, Timothy Salen. Um, he's actively involved in water conservation, sustainable landscaping, and responsible agriculture in Florida. Um, he has been president of Cherry Lake for uh, 15 years and promotes it through that venue. Um, Cherry Lake is a vertically integrated landscape company that provides commercial landscape and irrigation construction and maintenance services. And it's the largest grower of ornamental trees, palms, and shrubs in the state of Florida. Um, I'll let you read some of the other provisions on it on the uh, slide right here, but I'd also like to mention that we recently welcomed him to the Board of Directors of 1000 Friends of Florida, and um, he's very passionate about these topics and um, is going to be working on some upcoming webinars as well, so we're really pleased to welcome him to our Board of Directors. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Timothy and um, let him get started on his presentation. Thank you, Vivian, and good afternoon to everyone on the call. I am uh, honored to be here and to present to you guys this presentation on promoting sustainable urban forests. There's a lot to cover, and I probably won't be able to um, speak about everything that may be of interest, but I will try to start by going through some statistics and information on trees and the urban forests so we can get a sense of magnitude an understanding of how we can measure or estimate the economic and environmental value of our urban forests. And you need to and, click on your um, accepting showing the screen. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So um, and I, as I go through some of this information, we'll drill down from the, the macro to the micro and try to get a sense also of what are some of the challenges that are causing our urban forests to struggle and understanding those challenges. I'll speak about some strategies that we can use as planners, landscape architects, arborists, and members of the various industries to promote a healthier and more sustainable urban forest for the future. And if we get through all of that, uh, we'll have some time to talk about some specific selections of trees that um, can be used in Florida and the different regions of Florida. As I go through this presentation, I'll take the time to introduce you to a few of my favorite trees. And starting with the tree that is currently displayed, this tree, some of you might be able to identify it, is a tree called the Angel Oak. It's a southern live oak that is located on Johns Island near Charleston, South Carolina. It is estimated to be 400 to 500 years old. And it's 60, 66 feet tall, 28 feet uh, in circumference. So that's one of the trees that we'll meet today. First question I have is, how many trees are there in the entire world? And that's a question that we can now answer thanks to a recent study that was done and published in the journal Nature. There are an estimated three trillion 40 billion trees. And this was accomplished by doing both field surveys uh, around the world, teams of people who were going into forests and into different regions of the planet and counting trees and creating some statistical measurements and combining those efforts with satellite imagery and uh, computer modeling to determine that there are approximately three trillion trees on the planet. The good news is that this is eight times more than previously estimated. 
The bad news is it's about 46% less than there were at the dawn of human civilization. The article is very interesting. It's called Mapping Tree Density at a Global Scale. It gets into a lot of additional detail in terms of the distribution of these trees, types of forest and regions around the world. I provided a link to the research that I encourage you guys to check out. And some of these links, in fact, all the links I'll mention during this webinar are available in the handout. Another thing that we learned from this study is that 15 billion trees are cut down annually. And when we account for the new trees that are planted, we have a net loss of 10 billion trees per year. There are 422 trees per person on the planet. But as we lose 10 billion trees a year, we're losing 1.4 trees per person per year. So at this rate, it won't be long before there are many fewer trees on the planet and we might get into a situation where we're going to be struggling to maintain the environmental services that our forests have been providing. So we can understand now, generally speaking, how many trees are on the planet, but what is the value of a tree? And more specifically, what is the value of a tree in an urban forest? Fortunately, we also have some pretty good tools for understanding the value of trees in urban communities. The US Department of Agriculture Forest Service has developed a suite of tools that help to measure the economic value of our, of our urban forest. Um, this tool is called the iTree, and it's also linked in the resources. It allows cities to do statistical surveys of their urban forests by doing counts, um, measuring uh, tree size, variety, and quantity, and specific plots entering this information into the software tools, and then the software tools will produce an evaluation of the economic value of the urban forest based on the environmental and ecological services that the trees are providing. Um, this is important because it gives urban foresters and planners municipal decision makers the ability to frame what the value of their urban forest is and advocate for the urban forest. It puts us in a better position to do cost benefit analyses for investing in either managing and sustaining the trees that we have or planting more trees. Um, so what are the values that are measured? The iTree system is going to look at structural values and annual functional values. Structural values are the compensatory value, which is basically what it would cost to replace the trees that are in, in, in the urban forest. And this is something that is based on uh, appraisal assessments of trees. So to give you an idea, for the city of New York, the compensatory value is $6.2 billion to replace all the trees in the city of New York. Carbon storage is another structural value which measures the amount of carbon that is stored in the biomass of the trees. And this is uh, a lifetime value. Annual values are values that are realized annually. And in this case, you have carbon sequestration, which is slightly different than carbon storage. Carbon sequestration is the amount of carbon that is removed from the atmosphere each year and eventually goes into the, the carbon storage in the tree. Stormwater capture, air pollution removal, water pollution removal, lower energy cost, and reduced carbon emissions are all values that can be quantified in terms of um, biophysical measurements and also economic measurements. And so once a city goes through the process of completing their survey, they'll start getting numbers such as 
how many tons of carbon is stored, how many tons per year of carbon is sequestered, uh, how many tons per year of pollution is removed from the air and, and what the value is typically in millions and tens of millions of dollars to the city. Now, for a mega city, the average value of the urban forest, it turns out, is $505 million a year of services. This was conducted recently uh, where they took 10 mega cities around the world and took them through the process of evaluating the value of the urban forest using the I-Tree model. The 10 cities were Beijing, Buenos Aires, Cairo, Istanbul, London, Los Angeles, Mexico City, Moscow, Mumbai, and Tokyo. And the average for those 10 cities was $505 million a year. Um, not every city is a mega city, um, but it came out to $1.2 million per square kilometer. And even further uh, down to $35 per resident. So the urban forest does provide significant amount of value in terms of these environmental services, which are offsetting other costs that a municipality would otherwise have to invest in traditional gray stormwater infrastructure uh, or other related cost of uh, health um, when you have higher levels of air pollution or energy cost, cooling cost, um, dealing with the higher levels of carbon and um, and the loss benefit of, of the trees in reducing temperatures. So I think this is one way that we can start to quantify the value of the urban forest and hopefully uh, arm advocates with better information for advocating in favor of investing in our urban forest. This is another tree I'd like to introduce you to, although some of you may recognize this tree. This tree is called Methuselah, and it is 4,849 years old, approximately. Thought to be the oldest tree on the planet that is not a clonal tree. And uh, it's located somewhere in the White Mountains of Inyo County in Eastern California. The location of this tree is being kept secret um, as People who care about the tree don't want too many tourists coming in and trampling around the tree. Unfortunately, there was a tree right next to it that was significantly older. And in order to find out how old it was, somebody decided to cut it down and count the tree rings. So we lost that tree, but we still have Methuselah. And it is uh, a Great Basin bristlecone pine. I like to think about what has happened over the course of human history over these last 4,800 years. And just imagine you know, how much this tree has, has experienced and borne witness to. So we know that certain trees can live for four or 5,000 years, but what is the life expectancy of an urban tree? And understanding the life expectancy of an urban tree is useful in planning how we manage the urban forest. Because if we're trying to meet certain objectives of tree coverage or tree canopy, number of trees per acre, we need to know not only how many trees we have, but how many trees we're losing and at what rate, so that we can make sure that our investments in planting new trees are calibrated to ensure that we're going to get the type of net increase in urban tree canopy that we're seeking. Well, there's a number of different studies that have been done to help answer this question. Originally, a lot of people were saying the average life expectancy of an urban tree in the United States is 10 years. And this is a statistic that a lot of arborists have mentioned over, the, over time. And it comes, comes from two separate studies that were done in the 80s um, and early 90s, which was basically a survey of urban foresters asking them what do you think is the average life expectancy of a tree in your community? And so that number was seven to 13 years. Since then, we've had a few more studies that have been done. And um, the best study that I like to refer to is this comparative analysis of other studies by uh, Romana and Scatena, also in the resources that's provided as a handout. Um, they found that the average life expectancy was 19 to 28 years, which is not significantly more 
than the seven to 13 years. And they further explain that average or mean life expectancy is maybe not the metric that we should be focusing on, but rather the uh, half-life of the tree population. And the reason for that is statistically, there are going to be a smaller number of trees that will live a very long time as they're genetically apt to do. And that's going to skew the statistics of average or mean. So if we look at the half-life, which is the number of years at which half of the original population will have died, the numbers are 13 to 20 years. And that's based on an annual mortality rate of three and a half on the on the low end to 5.1% per year. So somewhere between three and a half and 5.1% of our trees are dying every year. So that also means the flip side is that it's 96% are, are surviving every year. But still, it's not a very good statistic. Um, I don't think that it in, it's what we should expect when we plant trees, usually the thought of planting a tree leads to thinking about future generations. It's something that you do, that you plant with a child and you hope that that child could come back when they have grandchildren and look at this tree and, 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 and pass that tree on to future generations. Certainly that's my aspiration as a tree farmer and as a person who plants trees. But the reality is when we plant trees in our cities, we're not getting past the first generation. Uh, this, this chart here, which you're looking at, just shows the distribution of uh, tree mortality rates by the size of the tree. And what this shows us is that there's a high incidence, a higher incidence of mortality with the younger trees, which is understandable because our younger trees, which are the ones that we're probably planting in the landscape, are going through a process of establishment, tree stress, and they're less adapted and equipped to to survive in the environment. As they get established over time, mortality rates decline. But nevertheless, uh, there is a high incidence of tree mortality in urban forests, and this is something that ought to be addressed. And in order to address it, we need to start thinking about strategies. This is another tree I'd like to introduce you to. This tree is called Old Chico and is located in um, Scandinavia, Sweden. And it is considered to be one of the oldest living organisms on the planet. It is 9,500 years old. This was uh, determined through carbon dating. It is not the same as um, Methuselah in the sense that this is a clonal species, which which is to means that it regenerates itself from its root system. So the top of the tree may have died many times over, over the past 9,500 years, but the root system of the tree is the original organism that, that came to be 9,500. Timothy, we've just lost your sound. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, before we can get into specific strategies for improving the health and longevity of urban trees, we should look at some of the factors that have it as contributing to the mortality of trees. Um, there are biophysical factors. Uh, the genus species of the tree obviously is going to be important. Some trees can live for 100 years. Some trees can live for 4,000 years. The uh, planting space characteristics is also critically important and perhaps one of those factors that we can influence quite a bit. Um, planting space characteristics are going to include not only your soil conditions, um, but also the surrounding environment. When you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of streets and sidewalks and curbs and utilities, you're going to create a lot of obstacles for that tree. Um, Tree characteristics, the size, age, condition, planting season, and then the quality of the nursery stock um, have been identified as being the key factors. And I'll speak a little bit more about each of these things as we get into the, the next few slides. Um, in addition to biophysical factors, we have human factors, uh, stewardship and maintenance, land use, socioeconomic measures, unstable home ownership, and, and the rest you can read. Um, 
So there are things that we can do. The issue with tree health and tree mortality is usually complex in that there isn't a single factor that is going to be the culprit for the decline or the death of the tree. In fact, arborists speak of a mortality spiral, which is to say that once a tree has been stressed or weakened, it is vulnerable to further stress and attack. So once we start adding up a number of small stressors, we get to a critical point where the tree is going to spiral and decline rapidly, leading to ultimate mortality. There's a lot of things that are going to cause stress to a tree. It could be pest, it could be disease, it could be drought, it could be flooding, it could be uh, lack of oxygen or aeration in the soils, constriction, it could be mechanical or physical damage, um, and, and, and many, many more factors that would be very difficult to list exhaustively. But what happens is after one, two, three stress uh, events, that tree is now less and less capable of defending itself and protecting itself from further attack um, and thus the mortality spiral. So when we're speaking about factors and strategies for maintaining the health of our urban forest, we have to think holistically and try to try to minimize stress everywhere that we can. This is another tree. One of my favorite trees personally is the bald cypress. And this is an example of a bald cypress. This tree has a name. It was, uh, had a name, I should say. It was called the Senator Bald Cypress. It was located in Longwood, Florida. And it was the tallest, oldest, and largest bald cypress tree on the planet. Uh, before it died, it was 3,500 to 4,000 years old, making it the fifth oldest tree in the world. It probably survived a very large number of hurricanes, floods, fires, lightning strikes, droughts, and who knows what else. It finally succumbed to a crack addict who was using the park to uh, stay warm and to do drugs. And it was a little windy, maybe it was raining. And this person decided that they would go into the cavity of this giant tree in the trunk. There was a huge cavity where you could fit a dining room table. And she sat there and was smoking some kind of drugs and lit a fire to stay warm, it caused the tree to go up in flames. It acted like a chimney and the tree burned down. It took three days for it to burn down. They arrested this person. And when they explained to her what she had done, her quote was, holy shit, I just killed something older than Jesus. So unfortunately, if you didn't get a chance to see this tree, you've missed it. It happened about, I think it was five years ago, this tree burnt down. And it's just a reminder that if there's an old uh, champion tree in your neighborhood to go and see it now. Fortunately, in the same park, Big Tree Park in Longwood, Florida, there are two other giant bald cypress that are not quite as old, but still two or 3,000 years old each. So um, I wanna speak about a few strategies um, for promoting sustainable and healthy urban forest. The first thing is to plant the right tree in the right place. And this is something that you've certainly heard if you've talked to an arborist or gone to any arborist presentation, but it can't be stressed enough. Biodiversity is critical, nursery stock quality, very important, selecting native and Florida friendly plants, and then understanding the dynamics of how the market availability interacts with our planning for planting trees. And I'm going to cover some of these briefly and probably a little superficially, but there will be time for questions and hopefully um, some of these slides will, will lead to some additional questions. Planting the right tree in the right place is, is absolutely uh, number one. Starting with the hardiness zone, understanding what, what climate the tree is adapted to and how it can deal with different extremes of heat and cold. Uh, we see a lot of people in Orlando, projects in Orlando who are trying to plant tropical, tropical tr plants and trees. It looks good uh, at the beginning, but inevitably they're going to freeze. Sometimes we can go 10 years without a major freeze and people start becoming very comfortable. 
and they plant more and more tropicals, but it's just a matter of time before we have a really hard freeze, at which point we'll lose a lot of trees. Um, hydrology and soils are probably equally important to hardiness. And this is something that we're not doing a very good job of as an industry. Uh, we think that we can go in and clear a property and then uh, build what it is that we want to build and then come in and landscape it to look exactly the way we want it to look. But if we're not paying close attention to the interaction between hydrology and soils, we're not going to have longevity or sustainability. Uh, trees are all adapted to different hydrological conditions. And that means, you know, the hydro periods, the length and duration and depth of water in the soils and also the porosity and drainage and the sheet flow of water through those soils. Genetically, trees are adapted to very specific conditions. And if they're planted in the correct conditions, then they're going to thrive and probably live for a very long time. But if we force a tree where it's not adapted, it's just not going to work. Um, a very simple example is planting magnolia trees in wet sites, something that is not going to work. Magnolia trees need to be well-drained, so they need to be in hopefully sandy soils or uh, in soils that are relatively dry without a high water table. A lot of developers or builders are looking now more and more towards building in, in wetter areas with a higher water table. And they may assume that they can get the same look on those properties that they've been used to getting when they were building in sandier, drier areas. So they asked their landscape architect to put magnolias, which the landscape architects will oblige, and then the magnolias get planted, but they won't last more than a few years, or they'll last maybe five, 10 years, but they'll never really look good and thrive. It has everything to do with hydrology and soils. So there's two things that we can do. One, we can focus on planting trees that are adapted to the soils that we have, or, in addition to that, we can remediate our soils and try to be a little bit more proactive in investing in our soils so that we can get healthy landscapes. Um, this is, by the way, going to impact not only the longevity of the landscape, but also the cost of maintaining that landscape, not only in terms of dollars, but in terms of inputs. So if you have the right hydrology, you're going to need less water, less fertilization and less pesticides which from an environmental cost as well as an economic cost, there's lots of benefits to getting this right. Other factors, um, you know, the planting space, uh, generally speaking, you know, where is it going and what's the tree going to grow into? We can say the trees are going to die in seven years, so it doesn't matter. But if we really are counting on these trees reaching their full potential, we have to realize that some of these trees are going to be 70 feet tall by 40 feet wide. So let's not put them under power lines or right up against buildings or in areas where that's going to become a problem. Uh, biodiversity is also a very, very important consideration when we're talking about the sustainability of our forest and our urban forest. There's um, biodiversity can be defined in terms of ecosystems, species, and genes. And when it comes to trees, um, they're really isn't that much diversity. This is an interesting um, map that was uh, the result of a geological survey that mapped the diversity of species across the United States. And I was surprised when I saw it because it looks like large swaths of the country have very, very low diversity. Floor is actually pretty diverse and the panhandle appears to be the most diverse of all. Um, but we need to try to take advantage of the maximum amount of diversity as is possible within our region. So there's limitations based on climate and soils and, and hydro hydrological conditions. But within those limitations, there are a number of well-adapted species and that's what we want to focus on. A lot of people are limited in what they will plant for, for one reason or another. The most common one I get is we don't want deciduous trees because it doesn't look good for three months out of the year. So that's all fine and good, but when you are trying to plant shade trees in Florida and you're limited to evergreen trees, you're basically limited to live oak. There just aren't very many evergreen shade trees. So when we limit ourselves, we are going to greatly reduce the diversity of species. And what happens is we're planting hundreds of thousands of live oaks every year. And 
um, that's fine. But if there's something that comes in and attacks the live oak, it could be a pest, it could be a disease, we're going to have a problem. We see the issue, for example, in citrus, where we have a citrus greening disease, which is devastating the citrus crop. Now, that's an agricultural commodity crop, very important to our industries. It's not necessarily part of our urban forest, but it's an example of what could happen to any species of trees. In the, in the past, in the Northeast, we had Dutch elm disease, which devastated the American elms. So the more live oaks we plant, the more risk we're, we're facing. Furthermore, if we look at the diversity of the genes within the live oak um, genus species, we have cultivars, which are asexual clones. You may have heard of species uh, or cultivars such as live oak cathedral or live oak high rise. There's a, there's a use for those and a place for those. And we certainly advocate using those in very specific situations. But if we don't plant a lot of seedling live oaks, we're further limiting the gene pool. Um, and then um, selecting trees and species based on their adaptation to the state. The best resource um, I would say is the Florida Friendly database, uh, which identifies not only native plants, but also plants that are well adapted to the state of Florida. This is a resource that's also in the handout. This tree is another live oak. And um, I think it might also be the angel oak. So unless it's the tree of life and I'm, I've got my notes mixed up, but let's just call it another beautiful live oak. Um, one of the factors or strategies is going to be promoting quality of the nursery stock. And one of those early slides talking about the longevity of trees in the urban landscape, we saw that the smaller trees were the ones that had the highest mortality rate. And that's because the trees that are taken from the nursery and planted in the, their final location in the urban forest are going through an extreme event. It's not something that a tree normally does. A tree doesn't usually move from one location to another. So there are a lot of stress stores that are going to be introduced in this process of taking the tree out of the nursery and transporting it to the new location and planting it, um, introducing it to new soils and a new environment. So this whole process of transplanting and establishing the trees is very difficult for a tree to withstand. And we have a high degree of mortality, if not right away in the first two or three years. One of the things that we can do to mitigate that is to plant high quality nursery trees. And understanding what a high quality nursery tree is very important for people who are in, in municipalities or in the development business uh, to have a sense of what they're buying. It's not very easy though, because it's not like buying roof shingles um, or drywall where you know there's specs and measurements and you pretty much know exactly what you're going to get. When you're buying trees, you're buying a green good. It's a living organism. and uh, most of what's important you can't even see because it's the root system and that's below ground. Fortunately, we do have the Florida Grades and Standards, which is an excellent tool for helping people to uh, communicate on tree quality and establishing some standards. Most municipalities are going to use this as part of their codes and ordinances. So it is a minimum standard. When we talk about Florida number one trees, um, that really is the minimum standard, but it gives us a place to, to agree and to discuss what makes a quality tree. Um, there are four grades, Florida Fancy, Florida Number One, Florida Number Two, and Coal. The idea of a Florida Fancy is a little bit more of a, uh, a, a, tr a perfect tree that, that kind of gives us a guideline for what we're striving for. It's not a practical specification because in reality, inspectors will always find a flaw in a tree that will downgrade it from a Florida fancy to a Florida number one. It certainly would be difficult to source a large quantity of trees that are Florida fancy. Florida number one is the um, grade that most municipalities are going to rely on. Florida number two is a tree that I wouldn't, I wouldn't plant unless it were some sort of remediation project or back a house buffer project. Uh, and then a coal is something that should never be 
planted, something that the nursery should dispose of. There are seven steps for grading a tree. This has been simplified. It used to be 10 steps. There was an update to the grades and standards that came out a couple years ago. There's also a link to the grades and standards in the handout. Um, it's not very complicated, and it's something that somebody can learn how to do in about 45 minutes to an hour if they have a good trainer. Uh, this could be the topic of another webinar, um, and we do some trainings at our nurseries. Something that I would encourage municipalities to do is to get their inspectors trained because if we're requiring Florida number one grade in our codes and ordinances, we need to have inspectors who are capable of, uh, of establishing whether or not the trees are meeting grade. Um, but it is a simple process. There are seven steps. Um, first step is very easy. You just have to pick what matrix the tree belongs to. Uh, the second step you grade for the trunk structure. Uh, the third step is grading for the crown uniformity. Um, I think the fourth step, you just record the lowest grade. And then the next um, two steps, you ask a couple of questions, um, a true or false questions about uh, whether the tree is in the right proportion, uh, if there are any pests and disease, open trunk wounds, um, or different indicators that would uh, be a cause to downgrade the tree. And the final step is grading the quality of the root system. And the root system is probably the most important aspect of tree quality, and yet it's one of the most difficult ones to evaluate because we really can't see it. It's not reasonable to try to wash out all of the root systems and dig up the roots when we're inspecting and buying trees. So we do have some limitations there. Um, there have been some innovations in the nursery industry. The um, most um, recent one is a group of nursery container growers who have developed a process and a brand for certified container trees. It's called Reason 7. Uh, the idea behind this is that it's a, a certified process where growers are using uh, a specific process for developing root systems that includes using certain advanced uh, container technologies like air pots and pioneer pots. And then a process is called root shaving which um, corrects root defects by pruning or cutting the defective roots off before the tree is moved up to the next stage. And this is something that's done each time. Uh, we feel that if you follow a process, um, you're going to have consistent results. And that is the reason for this particular brand of trees. This is a tree that many of you may know. Uh, it's called General Sherman, and it is a giant sequoia located in the redwood forest. It is the tallest single stem organism on the planet. Uh, it's about 2,000 to 2,700 years old, and it's uh, very, very tall, 83.8 meters. That's 275 feet. Um, there used to be a tree right next to it that was twice as tall, and it was cut down in 1908 by uh, loggers, and a stump remains. And one of the curious things about trees, it's kind of a mystery actually, but when trees go in a forest, there's an awful lot of cooperation that is happening where the trees are working together. And this cooperation uh, occurs mostly below ground, although there's a lot of processes uh, with uh, aerosols where they're communicating through uh, chemicals like pheromones, the way ants would communicate. But they're mostly communicating through, um, through electrical signals that are traveling through the roots and through the mycorrhizae and various fungal uh, symbiotic communities that wrap around the roots of trees and connect the trees all to each other within a forest. Well, it turns out that some of these stumps that were cut down hundreds of years ago are still alive. And what's interesting is that the only way that these stumps can be alive is if the other trees around it are keeping it alive because they no longer can photosynthesize. They don't have any branches or trunks or leaves and they're incapable of surviving on their own. But it turns out that um, these stumps are being kept alive by the trees who are sharing their precious, precious resources with this stump. Most mysterious thing about it is not all stumps are kept alive. Only certain stumps, it seems, are being treated this way by their, by their 
neighbors in the forest. So there's a lot going on in the social lives of trees. They do communicate, they do cooperate, and they are fairly sophisticated in their ability to sense and to respond uh, to changes in their environment and also to communicate with each other. So um, there's a really great little book out there. It's called The Hidden Life of Trees. If you have an interest in this subject, it's just a fantastic book that open your eyes to a lot of these, these little things that, that many people don't know. Uh, I'm going to kind of blast through this next section because I do want to leave time for questions, but I think it's important when we're talking about planning for the urban forest that we're sensitive to the relationship of what we are doing uh, in the uh, planting side and what's happening in the, in the, the market for trees. The uh, tree market is driven uh, by construction. Uh, that is the number one factor that affects demand for trees. And as uh, we've all experienced over the past 15 years, there's been just a huge volatility in the housing market. This shows housing starts. And so we know that we had a huge bubble followed by a huge crash. And now we've been recovering steadily and we're you know, probably around 120,000 units per year in Florida, uh, which is good demand, but it's not crazy demand like we had before. Well, trees take on average three to seven years to produce. So nurseries are having to plan for the uh, future demand uh, three to seven years in advance. So in 2008, 2009, 2010, when there is no demand for trees, the nursery growers are not planting a lot of trees because they don't they don't have the cash flow, they don't have the space, they don't have the heart, and uh, there's a huge drop off in the amount of trees that are planted. We also had a lot of tree uh, nurseries that went out of business through bankruptcy during the recession. Um, the blue line is is price, and it just equates um, with supply and demand, but. Um, the bottom line is that there's been a huge fluctuation in housing. We know now that our month supply of housing is is pretty low. Uh, I think it's maybe now close to south of three months of housing supply, which is an uh, indication that we have an undersupplied housing market, which suggests that we're going to continue to have housing growth. Um, here you have uh, housing starts in red and, and active listings in gray. So we have houses, we're, we're building more and more houses, but we have fewer and fewer houses to sell. So what that means is we're selling houses faster than we're building them, which also suggests that we're going to continue to have housing growth. Well, we don't have a, a lot of growth in the tree nursery supply because you cannot grow the supply very quickly. It takes three to seven years to grow a tree. So unless growers anticipated this and were planting more trees three to seven years ago, we're not going to be able to keep up. This is federal U.S. crop insurance liabilities for nursery material in Florida. And this is the best statistic that we have on, on nursery supply because most growers are going to buy the insurance. It's very cheap. It's subsidized by the government. But basically what it says is that in 2008, we had $1.4 billion worth of liabilities. And today we're somewhere around $470 million. So that is one billion dollars worth of liabilities less. So we have a fraction of the tree supply today that we did in 2008. Um, this is a complicated graph where we equate the liabilities, uh, insurance liabilities, the housing starts, and forecast what the supply of trees is going to look like in relation to a balanced market. The black line is equilibrium. There's one for one number of trees that people need, number of trees that are available. And we had, when the red line was over, the black line, we had a huge overage, tree prices were falling, nursery, nursery businesses were failing. And then we kind of came back even in 2013 and, and every, uh, everywhere you have the red line, below the black line, it's a tree shortage. There just aren't enough trees to meet the demand. This is a real issue um, that's gonna require some, some creative solutions. This next tree is the um, Montezuma bald cypress. It's a, uh, I'm sorry, the Montezuma cypress called El Arbol del Tule, and it's located in Mexico. It's a close relative of bald cypress, and it's believed to be the widest tree in the world. Um, 
So this tree has a circumference of 137 feet. And it's thought to be about 1,500 years old. I'm going to make a couple recommendations for codes and ordinances. But it's really not a comprehensive analysis of codes and ordinances. That may be a good topic for a future webinar. Um, but here's a low-hanging fruit. Number one, check your ordinance and see, are you guys calling out the tree sizes in terms of caliper or DBH, which stands for diameter at breast height? You should be using caliper. DBH is not an appropriate um, measurement for nursery trees. That is a forestry term that's used for measuring trees in the forest. Doesn't apply to uh, the trees that we are putting on new construction projects. So in terms of a uh, municipal codes and ordinances, the appropriate measurement is caliper. Whenever we use DBH in these codes and ordinances, it really causes a lot of confusion and can lead to some mistakes and, uh, and also create some disparities in the bidding process, which affects the construction process. And the second thing is, uh, what about your hedge material heights? Um, I'll get to that in a second, but just going back to the caliper versus DBH, Caliper is what's used in Florida grades and standards. There's a very specific way for measuring caliper. Trees less than four inch caliper, you measure at six inches from the ground. Trees over four inch caliper, you measure at 12 inches from the ground. That's what you want. DBH, diameter at breast height, is 54 inches from the ground or four and a half feet. So um, it's very confusing because not everybody has the same breast height but the standard is 54 inches and it's a forestry measurement. It's used for very large and mature trees. So back to hedge material heights, a lot of ordinances uh, are going to specify a height for uh, shrubs that are planting, planted along hedge, hedges. And uh, they won't really get involved in specifying heights for other shrubs. The issue is that we get a lot of different heights anywhere from 20, 24, 28, 30, 36 inches is a lot of times what we'll see. And there's a huge impact in cost, especially when you go from 28 inches up. And that's usually the breaking point between a three gallon and a seven gallon. The breaking point will vary depending on market availability. The, the higher the demand for shrubs, the smaller the shrubs are going to be. But typically, if you're you, you have an ordinance that creates some confusion. It creates a huge disparity in the bidding process because a, a seven gallon tree is going to be three or four times more than a three gallon shrub, excuse me. So three to four times more can have an impact of 50 to $150,000 on a project. And these kind of ambiguities are really frustrating to, uh, to uh, landscape companies, nurseries and, and developers trying to figure out how to price and to source the material. It also leads to people cheating or stretching, trying to get the tallest plant that they can, even if it's not a very high quality plant. And that's ultimately going to hurt us down the road. You're going to get six to eight inches of growth in the first spring. So it's better to start with maybe a smaller, high quality plant. And to get the highest quality plant, you really want to try to steer your ordinances where people are um, being asked to source a three gallon tree or shrub for hedges, which is probably the most realistic and what's actually happening in, out in the field. So those are my two recommendations. I'd like to revisit this in the future, maybe with more thorough recommendations. So, you know, I think that's probably a good stopping point. I have provided a, a selection of trees here. There's some slides, but you guys have the PowerPoint presentation. And you can look at them. I started with my favorite tree, which is the bald cypress. Um, rather than take up the rest of our time talking about specific trees, I'd rather open it up for questions. I'm happy to talk about particular trees if those are the questions you, you have. And also, I'll point to the, uh, the links provided in the handout. There's a link to not only the Florida Friendly Plant Database, where you can learn a lot about these species, but there's also a link to Cherry Lake's website where we have uh, tree fact sheets where you can download PDFs and pictures and get a lot of information about these different species that I'm not going to go through, but I will click through the slides to get to the end and you can get a little preview of some of the trees I had prepared for you. And thank you very much for your attention. It's been a, a real honor. 
Um, I'll just end here. This is the final tree I wanted to share with you, and this one really blows my mind. Um, this is called Pando, or Trembling Giant, and uh, it is a clonal colony of quaking aspens uh, located in Utah. And since this is one single root system that's just regenerating above ground, the root system itself is probably the oldest living organism on the planet, 80,000 years, and also one of the largest organisms on the planet, weighing 6,000 metric tons. It has over 40,000 stems, but only one root system, and it is one organism. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tim. We really appreciate that. that was a really, um, really thorough presentation that gave a, a great amount of tremendous information. So we really appreciate it. Um, we do um, have a number of questions as discussed, um, and I'd like to go through as many of them as possible. Um, of course, some of them started up at early on in your presentation, so we're going to go back to the beginning here. Um, this was a question, I think, about the iTree uh, site. Um, and it was talking about annual functional values. Do these annual functional values take into account Florida evergreen trees that are providing ecosystem benefits year round, unlike many deciduous trees up north? Um, and I didn't know if you could address that question. I will do my best. I, I don't want to speak authoritatively on that because I'm not an authority on iTree, but my understanding is that it does take into account um, species uh, specificity. And it also has been done in a number of Florida cities. I know Gainesville has done it. Um, I think Tampa has done it and, uh, and a few others. So what I would recommend is if you're interested in doing iTree in Florida is uh, looking up uh, which cities have already done it and maybe getting in touch with them. I think Gainesville would be a good one because they worked with uh, Professor Escobedo, who's with the University of Florida and, and probably can provide a, a great amount of assistance. Um, but I do think it, it does take into account species specificity. Okay, um, again, another question from early on. Um, somebody was asking about the name of the clonal tree in Sweden. They missed that and were very interested in it. Do you recall the name of that tree? Yes, that tree is uh, Old uh, Tahiko, and I, I may or may not be pronouncing that right. I'll spell it for you. Um, that would be T J I. K K O. Okay. Um, we have a question um, from Martin County um, talking about how it's common practice, and you discussed this, to plant live oaks right next to sidewalks for shade and to create canopy over the roadway. Um, then um, people find themselves having to cut out the main routes to eliminate trip hazards on sidewalks and roads. Uh, do you have any suggestions or recommendations on species that could be used near sidewalks that still grow tall, provide shade, canopy, but have less damaging roots? It's a tough, it's a tough question to answer because there's, there isn't a silver bullet uh, for this particular problem. We um, want shade next to sidewalks uh, for a lot of good reasons, and we also want our sidewalks to remain intact. Um, the live oak is um, one of the very few evergreen shade trees that we have, as I mentioned previously. There are some deciduous shade trees that probably have slightly less aggressive root systems, uh, red maple, um, alley elm, or uh, any kind of um, uh, Olmus parvifolia, Chinese elm, also the uh, winged elm. Those are some good uh, trees to consider, but all of those trees are going to develop a big root system. And it's just one of those things that um, you can't get away from. It's what we call the shoot to root ratio. And the shoot to root ratio says for every for every gram or ounce of uh, biomass that you have above ground, you have an equivalent amount of biomass below ground, shoot to root ratio. So if you want a big tree, you gotta have a big root system. And roots grow near the surface because they need aeration. Um, they don't grow naturally deep. They're not gonna burrow five feet under the sidewalk and stay out of your way. So uh, what we can do is we can spend money to create root barriers and root zones. There's you know, it's very expensive and, and effective systems, um, engineered systems 
where you can put these silva cells or strata vaults under the sidewalks and um, also use structural soils. Um, we do it all the time for the theme parks. Disney and Universal will spend the money because you know they know it's eventually going to be a problem. So we can spend the money or we can you know keep replacing the trees every 10 years or we can have a certain amount of tolerance for busted up sidewalks. Um, that's you know that's something that people have to decide. I I like to look at New Orleans as an example. They have great trees, really big trees, um, and the same trees that we grow: magnolias, oaks, ligustrums, hollies, crepe myrtles, bald cypress. Same. The difference is that they're sitting on a continental shelf and they have like you know half a mile of sand, and they have the Mississippi alluvial delta, which is dropping off rich nutrient rich topsoil you know, from the, from the northern Mississippi and, and Missouri uh, flood, uh, flood plains. So it's the perfect growing conditions for trees. The result is they have really big, long-lived trees, but their sidewalks are also pretty dinged up. So it's a trade-off. Which would you rather? Okay. Um, the next question has several parts to it, so I think I'm going to try to break it up a little bit and maybe ask it in several segments. Um, and it relates to the issue of um, difficulty obtaining trees from vendors right now um, and wondering how long it should take nurseries to bounce back. And I realize you can't give a concrete answer on that, but are nurseries, in, in your estimation, starting to plant more aggressively now that the uh, economy is booming and are you saying it's going to be five to seven years before this starts to help prices and things? Yeah, so this is something that um, I could have spent an hour and a half on. Um, we certainly are very uh, interested in this topic and follow it very closely. The, the issue is that in order for trees to, if for nurseries to increase the amount of trees that they are making available, they, the first thing they can do is fill up the existing space that they have under production, which most nurseries have done that by now. So the farms that we have are basically full or being utilized to their full capacity. But beyond that, you have to, you have to create new production capacity, which means you have to add acreage under production. And that's pretty expensive because you have to buy the land and we know land isn't cheap. Then you have to you know, install irrigation systems you have to put in place holding systems and then you have to invest in the inventory. So if we invest in inventory, since it takes three to seven years to grow the tree, it's a very big investment. In fact, it's, we, we estimate it's a dollar 70 of capital invested for $1 of sales, which is a crazy number. Usually the ratio is completely reversed, you know, and in, in landscape maintenance, it's 25 cents invested for a dollar in sales. So you need people with deep pockets who view the nursery business as a good investment. And right now, I'm not sure that people are going to view it as a good investment. Sure, right now the business is good. There's no doubt about it. If you look at this year and last year and next year, great. But we're talking about making investments for 20, 30 years. You've got to look back 20, 30 years and look forward 20, 30 years. What we just went through with the recession was so devastating. It's a big turnoff to investors. And the other thing is what we went through with Hurricane Irma is a big turnoff to investors because there were huge amounts of losses. The Department of Agriculture uh, estimated that there was something like $233 million worth of losses in Florida on nursery trees. So what we're not seeing is we're not seeing outside investors coming in and increasing the, the acreage under production. Really haven't seen that yet. And until that happens, I don't think we're gonna catch up because Construction is growing faster than than we can, than the nurserymen can. You know, construction is growing at maybe 10% a year, maybe 15% a year. Um, you know, it looks like it's going to be pretty good for a while. So, unless nursery stock is increasing faster than housing starts are increasing, the problem's actually getting worse. My opinion is that we're not going to see any kind of significant relief for the next three to five years, which is as far I care to project. Okay. Um, the second part of the question relates to a difficulty ensuring that contractors perform the maintenance as required. Um, are there any solutions aside from good site selection and stock selection that 
municipalities can implement that will improve their tree survivability or is taking over maintenance entirely the solution and on there are there any good case studies on this issue that's a great question um, I'm not aware of case studies uh, although I'm sure uh, there, there may be some out there I think you know getting the right nursery stock to begin with is key and one of the things I would suggest is that you provide a little bit of flexibility in the interpretation of of the specifications especially when it comes to the size of the tree and to give you an example a three inch caliper tree is usually a typical spec there's a big difference in the marketplace right now between two and three quarter inches and three inches it could be double the price and a contractor is usually just focused on their margin so they've got to get three inches they can get it but they're going to get the, the cheapest tree they can find that's going to meet that three inch and you're going to end up with three inches but you're not going to have a good root system and you're not going to have good genetics you're not going to have a good crown and trunk structure on the other hand if you have a good contractor and you can work with them and they tell you look I can get you two and three quarter inch and I'm going to get you high quality roots, high quality uh, crown and truck structure. You're better off with that smaller tree. Absolutely. Um, but back to the maintenance, you know, we, we need to hold contractors accountable to their scope somehow. Um, if we don't have the resources to do the inspections and the contract management, maybe it is better for the city to maintain the trees. I'm not I'm not sure what the answer is um, there, but some if we expect the trees to main, be maintained and if the municipality is paying for it, we certainly need to get the contractors to be held accountable. OK, thank you. Um, the next question um, relates to um, soil conditions and their impacts. Um, they said you mentioned soil as part of the right tree in the right place, but during the construction phase of streetscapes in urbanizing environments, you most often have graded sandy or loam soils with a thin layer of topsoil placed on top. How do trees respond to these conditions? And I think you mentioned a little bit about the whole issue of, you know, that's one way to improve survivability is to invest more in the soil. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yes. Um, but maybe Vivian, could you restate the part of the question about the specific soils they're interested in? Okay, um, this is sandy loam soils with a thin layer of topsoil placed on top. Mm -hmm. So soils come in lots of different types and varieties. Um, and I, I'm definitely not a soil scientist myself. Uh, my experience is that um, well-drained soils are the best situation that that we can work with um, because you can always you can always manage irrigation and uh, nutrients and also you can always amend the soils uh, to to add um, organic matter if they're well drained that's that's probably the the most important characteristic when you have really um, mucky uh, or poorly drained soils uh, clay soils or high water table or highly compacted soils, those are the most difficult situations to deal with because you just don't get enough air and sometimes it's just really hard to get the water out of the root ball. Uh, the water will, will, will rot out the tree, it'll rot out the roots. So if you have a, 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 a sandy soil underneath and, and the, a thin layer topsoil, most likely you probably are not getting a lot of rich nutrients. Um, that can be addressed by including um, slow release uh, fertilizer with the trees uh, when you plant them and then following up with fertilization um, afterwards or you can incorporate compost and there's a really interesting compost that we're interested in right now it's called life soils uh, command which is a uh, a compost that University of Florida is doing some trials on it it's a uh, it uses microorganisms to break down the, the compost, so they're not, it's not the traditional process of, of turning the compost. And it has a very, very high content of microorganisms. 7,000 unique species of fungi and bacteria and microorganisms um, in this compost. So if we can add back in some of that type of material, 
I think we're going a long ways to helping to rebuild the soil structure. You know, when I was talking about trees that communicate with each other, you know, through the roots and the fungi and all this stuff, there's a very rich uh, biological life that's going on in the soils. And we don't really have that in most of our soils. The way to rebuild it is to get organic matter and fungal fungal uh, organisms in place. And over time, hopefully, they'll start to rebuild those networks. Okay. Um, you had a slide on the human factors involved in um, the longevity of trees, and it included stewardship and maintenance, land use, socioeconomic measures, unstable home or home ownership, construction and redevelopment activity, traffic and transportation, um, group characteristics and landscaping norms and behaviors. We had um, one of our uh, listeners who wanted to find out a bit more about what socioeconomic measures you were talking about. Um, you know, this, this information is from research that um, I believe Deborah Hilbert um, recently conducted for the University of Florida, where she was uh, comparing a lot of the existing um, information out there, different studies, and identifying the biophysical factors that were cited in the various studies. So I can't say definitively uh, which socioeconomic measures um, were mentioned in those studies. Um, I just don't know. But uh, I can speculate. Timothy, you're breaking up if, if um, you have uh, any control over that. Are you there? Timothy, I think we lost you. Are you there? I don't know if you can hear me. Um, you're, you're breaking up. Um, Let's give it a moment and see if, if it comes back. It might be a, a signal or something. I was going to ask if people can hear me, and I guess people can hear me, but not Timothy. Um, it looks like Timothy is trying to sign back in. Um, so if you all can have a little bit of patience, um, we'll try to go through uh, as, as many of the questions left. Timothy, are you back? He's gone again. Uh, it seems like he's having some troubles on his end. Um, I just wanted, I can take a few minutes to, to um, update you on a couple of things. Um, for those of you who weren't on yeah. the first couple of minutes, are you back? I think I'm back. I changed, You're back. I changed connections. Hopefully this is better. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't want to speak about something I, I'm not real certain of, but there there are socioeconomic measures. Um, I can send some of that research uh, back your way uh, via Vivian. And uh, also there's there's a lot of really interesting um, uh, studies done by the University of Chicago or Banna on the impact of urban forest on um, on things like um, uh, vandalism in, uh, in neighborhoods, obviously crime rates. We know about SEPDED, uh, crime prevention through envir uh, environmental design. Um, uh, the impact of, of, of greenery and landscapes on outpatient recovery, on uh, uh, children with ADD and their ability to focus, on test scores, and on uh, consumer behaviors, um, the amount of money people will spend um, in, uh, in, in uh, commercial centers based on the amount of green space. So there's quite a lot of research on the link between uh, urban forest and uh, socioeconomic values, and that that's information that we can also maybe uh, make available. Okay, great. Um, a, a more specific question. Um, do you have any recommendations on street trees that are most compatible with tree wells or other green infrastructure um, for areas with limited root growth area? And that would probably depend on the part of the state as well. Yeah, I think, you know, that is, a little, I think, a little bit similar to the question that was asked about the uh, sidewalks. The there There is no perfect tree that doesn't have a, a root system that that's going to cause problems. You can go with uh, smaller trees. So if you, for example, use a standard crepe myrtle, that tree is going to be um, 
maximum 20 to 25 feet, its root system is going to be um, a lot more, uh, a lot smaller, and it's also going to be a more accommodating root system because they tend to, uh, they don't, they don't tend to be as woody, um, and therefore not as forceful. Um, you can use uh, something like a Eliocarpus or Japanese uh, blueberry, which, which is also going to be more of a 25 to 30 foot tall tree. Again, shoot to root ratio, the smaller trees have smaller root systems. Um, we know that live oaks are very woody, have uh, you know very aggressive root systems, so they'll, they're going to plow, plow through brick and, um, and concrete and asphalt eventually. Um, so they might be you're maybe not as good a selection. Maples have, uh, they're not as woody and they aren't going to be as aggressive although they're still going to develop a big root system. So I think you want to look at the size of the tree and also at, you know, the, the, the hardness of the wood. I think that is a factor. But ultimately, um, all trees are going to need space to grow. So we either need to figure out a way to give them more space by creating bigger, bigger sidewalk right of ways or, or putting in place these underground structures or increasing our tolerance for some of these conflicts. Okay, we had a related question um, that I think somebody else brought up as well. Um, this relates to tree wells and planters, and they were asking about the, the benefits of suspended pavement versus structural soils. And I know that I don't know what either of those are, so maybe you could describe those and touch on that issue briefly. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that I know enough um, on this topic or, or if I know exactly what suspended pavement refers to. Uh, structural soils um, are going to be um, different types of artificial aggregates that you can put underground that's going to create an optimal root zone um, or media for the, the roots to grow into. Um, you can also use some of that uh, structural soils to maybe create channels or pathways to guide the roots in the areas that that you would most like them to grow in. Um, and suspended pavement looks like it's a, uh, any technology that supports the weight of paving, thereby creating a void space underneath. So if that's what I think it is, uh, something like the straddle vault system or the Silva cell system would, would be um, a form of susp suspended pavement, which we use these. Um, they are pretty expensive, but they do work. Um, they're made out of plastic, like they're these giant Lego blocks that you can kind of fit together, and it, and then you it creates air spaces and channels. You can actually run uh, conduits and pipes, you know, through channels, and then it it kind of surrounds the root zone with um, with this plastic structure, and then in there you can put the backfill, or you can put structural soils, or just regular backfill, and then the roots will grow, and it'll it, it'll um, create a engineered surface that you can lay the asphalt on top of. Like I said, our experience with working with that has been at the theme parks uh, under hardscape or under, under uh, concrete, and um, it seems to be a good solution. You have to excavate, so there's a lot of excavation that goes on. You dig these, these huge pits, could be you know, a very large um, excavation, then you put in the, the uh, suspend, sus suspended pavement system, uh, they go in pretty fast. They're pretty easy to install, and then you plant the tree and backfill it. Um, we have to ship these things over from Australia because um, one of the main manufacturers in it is Australia. So it's not without cost, but it does work. Okay. Um, shifting gears a bit, you had talked about caliper versus DBH for um, ordinances. Would DBH be a more appropriate um, measurement for uh, tree protection ordinances, you know, trying to protect existing trees over certain sizes. Can you discuss that briefly? Yes, so that would be an appropriate use of DBH. Uh, DBH is for uh, mature trees or trees that are gonna be, you know, um, three or four feet in diameter. Um, that the, the reason they use DBH for bigger trees is because you can get a more accurate measurement of the trunk at 54 inches off the ground for a, a mature tree. But for a, a juvenile or adolescent tree, which is what we use for new plantings, you cannot get an accurate measurement at 54 inches. You need to be at 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 um, at six or 12 inches, which is caliper. So 
if you, as long as you keep the two separate and use them where they're appropriate, that's great. But for new planting, you want to use caliper. And I would agree with the question that for tree, tree measuring tree replacements on mature trees, DBH would be appropriate. Okay, um, shifting gears again, um, some park systems are planting new trees in a manner that is preparing for higher temperatures and climate change. Can you speak to what would be different taking that into account? Vivian, would you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, some city park systems are planting new trees in a manner that is preparing for higher temperatures and climate change. So I guess they're adjusting their plantings, um, anticipating higher temperatures and other impacts of climate change. Can you speak to what would be different taking that into account? Sure. So, um, you know, trees can evolve and adapt to changes in climate by simply moving. Right. So if it gets hotter, they can move north. Um, the problem is if we have rapid climate change, the trees won't be able to move fast enough on their own. The way that trees move is simply by wind and, you know, seed dispersal through animals. And then they you know take root further north. Um, so there is a forestry practice, which is to start taking some species that were more adapted to uh, a zone a little bit south of us and planting them in a percentage in our forest um, here so that if the climate warms or when it warms, we'll have already established a population of trees that are adapted to those climates. Um, at the same, same token, we want to move our trees north so that they get into a better zone. Um, I don't know uh, what scale that works, um, you know, when we're talking about municipal plantings, uh, if we could do it on a scale that's meaningful or if this is something that has to be done by the National Park Service, um, I, I'm just not sure. But it is a practice and it is something that many people are doing to prepare for climate change. Okay. Um, can you speak from a grower's perspective whether there's a growing demand in the market for Florida native plants? Yes, there is a growing demand, and I think uh, growers are, are trying to meet that by um, increasing the number of native um, plants available. Um, the, the reality is there just aren't that many uh, native trees um, for any given region, as we saw with that biodiversity uh, uh, chart. Um, so when it comes to trees, yes, we can try to grow a few extra trees species but it'll be you know three four five maybe ten extra species the real quantity is in the shrubs uh, there's a very large number of, of shrubs that could be grown that aren't being grown and uh, and I think more and more nurseries are trying to do that Cherry Lake which is a large nursery we don't call ourselves a native nursery quote unquote but we do grow probably 60 to 70 percent of what we grow is native um, with regards to integrating new varieties, the challenge is, is matching up supply and demand so that, you know, when the trees are available, somebody wants to buy them and the grower is successful selling that, that crop. Otherwise, they just get discouraged and they won't do it. And it's really a chicken or the egg. You know, who's, who's going to flinch first? Who's going to specify? Are you going to specify it first or are you going to grow it first? And there's, there's historically been a little bit of difficulty getting the two to, to match up. Okay. Um, given all the recent hurricanes in Florida and Texas and other places, are you aware of any studies that have been done that have analyzed how different species of trees um, withstand these events? Um, is there more information on what is better to plant from that perspective? The, there were quite a bit of studies that were done in 2005 um, after the uh, Charlie Francis Gene um, at the University of Florida, and I, I don't have the titles of those topics um, on the tip of my tongue, but there, there was, I think, several studies on her, um, you know, species selection for hurricane resilience uh, done by um, University of Florida IFAS. Um, so I'm sure you can find those online. I doubt that there's been anything done since Irma, um, but we have noticed certain things, you know, casually we're starting to see some, some correlations with species. Um, I think that ultimately though, the, the main thing is healthy root systems. That has to be the number one defense against wind. 
um, as well as, as planting trees in the right place, because if you don't have the right soils and hydrology, the roots are never going to take. Um, so species, yes, probably has a factor. Most importantly, I would think, is quality root systems and right tree, right place. Okay. Um, we have so many questions I'm trying to go through and, and pick out the more general questions that apply to a lot. Um, do you know whether other states have equivalent grades and standards and are nurseries in Florida obligated to disclose the grades on the plants they sell? Um, there's a, a national standard, which is the, uh, I think it's the ANSI standard or ANSI standards. Um, but in, in, in fact, most other states are using the Florida grades and standards. Florida grades and standards is probably the best um, document nationwide for nursery, nursery grades, and it, it's a Florida-based document. That, and it was updated two years ago, so it's very current. Um, so I think it's a, good, it's a good tool. Again, I consider it to be really the way that we established the, the minimum acceptable grade. There are a lot of trees that are considered Florida number one, and they're not all the same, and they're not all going to be the same price. And not everybody's going to want a tree just because it's a Florida number one. Uh, Florida number one allows for scars. It allows for bows in the trunk. It allows for a number of things that aesthetically might not be what uh, certain customers are looking for. But it's not concerned with aesthetics. It's concerned with structural stability and, um, and, and horticultural viability. So as long as that bow or that scar isn't a threat to the structural integrity of the tree, it's okay. Um, now, as to whether or not nurseries are required to disclose the grades, no, they're not. <clears throat> they, the grade is established um, at the job site, so uh, or whenever it's being graded, because the tree can be a Florida number two uh, at one moment, and the next moment it could be a Florida number one. Uh, all you have to do in some cases is to make a few corrected pruning cuts, so it's it's dynamic as well. Uh, the key is if you're going to specify, you really ought to enforce it. And if if you if you don't know how to enforce it, um, there's a good there's a lot of training programs. And in fact, Cherry Lake does training programs. We'd be more than happy to provide some additional training to, to municipalities. Like I said, you could train somebody without a background in ornamental horticulture or arboriculture how to grade a tree in about 45 to minutes to an hour. They can learn the system. Okay, that's great. Um, we're going to try to squeeze one or two more questions in. Um, certain cities have banned the use of plant materials that have had problems with pests or diseases, etc. Um, do you think live oaks are reaching the point where cities um, should ban them or just they should be looking for more alternatives to them um, to avoid future wipeouts? I don't think we should ban live oaks. That that would be a mistake. There's no evidence right now that there are any immediate threats, um, disease or pest. Um, and it is a keystone species. There's only a few keystone species in any ecosystem. So you don't want to get rid of your keystone species. What you don't want to do is is overplant and 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 not plant other species. So I think what we want is to encourage the diversity of street trees that are planted and find a way to get people to also plant red maple and sycamore and bald cypress and winged elm and um, <clears throat> some of these other species that 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 complement the keystone species. Um, but really there, you know, there really haven't been any diseases. It's a pretty hardy and resilient tree. Um, so it's a good one. Um, we do see diseases, and there, it is true that certain municipalities have banned um, in certain areas of the state. You won't be able to plant um, East Palaka hollies because of a spheriopsis problem that, 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 that happened about 10 years ago. Uh, we have some real concerns with uh, Texas Phoenix palm decline affecting certain species of, uh, of uh, Phoenix palms, and, uh, and we saw what happened in citrus. So it, these are real threats. But I wouldn't get ahead of, of the issue on live oaks. We don't have any major threats right now, and it's it's still an important tree. Okay, great. Um, I want to thank you so much for your outstanding presentation, and I'm sorry we couldn't get through more of the questions. There's there's a ton more questions, but um, I tried to get the ones that would be applicable to the widest audience. Um, I did want to say to um, the people who are in attendance that you will be getting a survey about an hour after the webinar is over, and um, 
it has a question about upcoming webinars. We're taking a hiatus over the summer to plan our fall events. So if you have specific topics or more detailed topics that you're interested in, please let us know and we'll do our best um, to accommodate them. And, and Tim, thank you again for an outstanding presentation. We're really appreciative that you were able to do this for us. My pleasure. Okay, thank you everybody, and we will be sending out information um, in August with our, our fall slate of webinars, so have a good summer. Take care. Thank you, everybody.